Hey, what's up, everyone? Back for another episode of Movie Time. Time. You got myself, Renee, Low Key Geek, the Geek, and the Wolf, Blake Wolf. What's going on, bro? How's it going, buddy? Uh, we're we've been talking about movies. We've been talking about what we've been seeing so far. I'm excited to, to talk with you about 2022 so far. Yeah, same here. I mean, look, we we are finally out of Oscar season. So we talked our asses off about movies from 2021. Obviously, there were probably other movies we could have talked about, but let's talk about the present and the now. Let's talk about, you know, we are already in Q2 of 2022. So we had a good amount of stuff that already came out in Q1, but we are fastly approaching the summer movie season. And there's a lot of stuff on the calendar that's coming out. So figured let's take the time to recap what we've seen so far this year what we've liked, maybe what we didn't like, and talk about what we're looking forward to for this next quarter. Because from now until June, July, whatever, there's a lot of stuff coming out. So, and the stuff that actually Blake and I are really looking forward to. So, uh, again, as always, if you're returning and listening and watching, thank you so much for joining us again for this other episode. Uh, if you're new, uh, and you like what you see and you want to hear us talk about movies more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button, punch that like button, show us some love and f- smash it, you know, slap it around, you know, you know, treat it like it owes you money. And if you want an audio version of this uh, episode, you could find it on your podcast platform of choice. Just look for the Low Key Geek channel there and you could download this episode and others. So thank you so much for all of your support. So 2022, um, technically we are still in a thing. So you can't say what it is because apparently YouTube kind of uh, demonetizes those videos now. So with the current state of the world that we're in, Mm -hmm. um, movie theater, you know, there's still a good amount of people who aren't going to movie theaters, but at least they're open. You know, this is like going to be probably the first full year that's going to be the case, knock on wood. So we have regular movies coming out and obviously there has been a good amount of things hitting the theaters, but also hitting streaming as well. Um, And I think that's what makes it a little bit difficult to keep up with everything that's coming out um, I, I think you we and I we talked about this briefly off off air where there's still a good amount of movies we haven't seen yet that just recently came out right um, so you know we're gonna focus at least on the things that we saw and talk about what we liked and, and everything like that so I'm gonna start off just my first one I want to mention because okay. it was a movie I wasn't expecting to like. And I saw it because I figured I have to check it out. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to be talking about it. And that's Jackass Forever. Forever. I, have to I, say... was, I was going to have that be my first one. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because that movie surprised the shit out of me. It was hilarious. It was touching. You know, it, it was just, it's fascinating when you really think about the Jackass crew and how long they've been together and how many years ago they've done this. It, I believe it's 30 years now or so. Yeah. And, you know, watching this on MTV, maybe I was a little older uh, of um, an audience for it, but still I found it hilarious, right? You know, I found it, you know, these crazy guys doing crazy stunts and all that stuff and really making quote-unquote jackasses of themselves and it was really entertaining right then of course they went into movies and and all that stuff and you wouldn't think that after all these years that they could possibly do anything new or they could possibly be still together and willing to do stuff because they're much older you know and everything but they found a way to make it still as entertaining as it was when you watched it back in the day without putting themselves too much at risk but now introducing a newer crop into the group but doing stuff that's even smart you know which i really found it you know refreshing and hilarious um and i i just had so much fun watching this i only watched it in the theater once but now that it's available on uh peacock i've watched it at least three other times 
because it's you, just so really? hilarious. Yes. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. The idea you're just putting it on like, eh, I'm having a bad day, put on Jackass, better day. 100%. I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. I, 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 is it Peacock or Paramount Plus? I think it's Paramount Plus. Um, but yeah, I would just maybe I'll be doing some work and I, I just want something in the background and I would just have it play and I would just <laughs> glance over and I would just start laughing and just yeah, it's it's an entertaining movie. It's a lot of fun. If you're into wrestling and you watch this weekend's past WrestleMania. Uh, this past weekend, as of the taping of this episode, um, Johnny Knoxville had a match, and a lot of the Jackass crew showed up. Yeah, even some of the newer members were there, and you know that was probably one of the more entertaining things I saw in wrestling in a very long time. And I don't watch wrestling, but I do watch WrestleMania because that's the big event, and anything can happen. But <laughs> I was really pleasantly surprised that they were there and all that. But yeah, Blake, what what are your thoughts on Jackass? I'm glad that's on your list too. For sure. I was thinking, like, what was the surprise one or one that's worth mentioning? I, if, if someone's a jackass head, then I'm about to sac- do some blasphemy. <laughs> I had never seen any jackass movie before, and the only times I had ever seen the show would have been, like, living room, friends, high school, nothing better to do. Someone goes, yeah. hey, let's watch those. And I'm sitting there, like, rolling my eyes, going, "These, this is so dumb. <laughs> I was, like, too snobby for it. We always talk about how, like, I'm a snobby film dude um, with elite tastes. I went to this one with friends, kind of knowing what I was, was getting into. I'd seen enough clips. It's been such mm-hmm. a part of the culture. I yeah. A lot of my friends, like, I was an emo pop punk kid. My friends were skaters growing up. Um, there was enough, like, I was, I was in that universe. Um and peripherally aware of it. It was the first time I went to the movie, went with a group of friends, and I had a great time. Uh, there was something really beautiful and sweet about the movie, yeah. about the aging of this group. Um, mm-hmm. This may be a send-off. It's definitely a passing of the baton. They had new members. They had more diverse members. They had the first mm-hmm. female members of it. Um, and what I thought was interesting, too, is even though I hadn't seen these movies before, I was aware of so much of this history Mm-hmm. And, like, one of the things that um, I, that I was thinking about afterward, because we, we ended up having, like, a deep conversation about <laughs> Jackass and, and it, like, turned to other things. But one is, I remember, because I, I enjoy fashion, Johnny Knoxville was an icon. Yeah. Especially, like, that late 90s, early 2000s yep. trucker hat, the ringer shirt, the mm-hmm. belt buckles, the jeans, that, whatever that look was. Yeah. Um, I think people call it like indie sleaze now, kind of, and it kind of became like a Terry Richardson or uh, Vice magazine kind of look. Yeah. But this dude was an icon doing it early and made a life as who, who has leading man looks, leading man charisma and charm, and then kind of found himself in this world. There's something about the legacy of this, and I think another favorite one, um, aspect of it for me is the Spike Jones aspect, mm-hmm. where dude who's an early skate video director, music video director, and ends up becoming like a very beloved auteur of indie cinema, things that I actually like in my snobby world. Movies like yeah. Her. Um, and yeah. then he's, I think he's on screen in the cameo here, and he's just kind of like was in the background of some of the earlier stuff or filming it. Um, there was something impressive about the legacy of it, and I'm glad that I went. If, if there's one movie that's going to be seen as like, okay, there's there's actually something happening here beyond being punched in the balls. There's like a legacy and a narrative of like these dudes' lives. Like there's something interesting there. There's some people missing because of uh, overdose or death yeah. or like uh, uh, tragedy. Um, but seeing some folks who were there since the very beginning and having that retrospective is there's something pretty beautiful about that. Yeah. And they were doing some like flashbacks to to older things that you'd seen and doing new versions of that which is kind of something they've always done um but they've had like if someone can, wants to talk about it being low brow and bad art or whatever like on the other hand there's other people who in the like elite academic kind of world like want to like really philosophize about like what does this say about masculinity and mm-hmm. like let's not take it too seriously but let's also take it seriously enough that like this is a legit franchise that has not just movies, but spinoff properties mm-hmm. uh, and has like spawned legit careers for a bunch of folks. 
Um, yeah. And it was cool seeing them. And then there were some really fun cameos in in here as well. I think Tyler, the creator, is probably my favorite of those. Yeah. Uh, Machine Gun Kelly was a funny one. Uh, but there was it was really fun seeing them kind of just like owning this moment and being comfortable at with with their careers and like uh, of making themselves uncomfortable. Yeah, no, for sure. It, and again, like also, it was great to see like Eric Andre still hanging out with those guys, you know, because sure. if, if you've watched Bad Trip last year. Oh my god, that movie is freaking hilarious. And it's the same director, um, same people involved with the Jackass franchise. So it's nice that he is part of that family now, you know, hanging out with those guys. But it, it is true. It's like, you know, you have these, you know, I guess, lack of a better term, geezers, like still doing all these childish stuff. But passing the baton to a co- another new group that is diverse and, and the, the female member is like hardcore man it's like she the things that she was able to withstand and take was just like mind-boggling to me but you know and i've heard people like talk about well what is the future for jackass now right like now that you have paramount plus is this maybe can they create a new streaming show maybe with this new group of of you know characters or what have you but i could still see the old guard hanging out being sure. like the mentors or the the ringleaders and everything and the perfect example of that and the reason why i said one thing that they did like they did some things that were very smart is uh, one of the the bits that they did didn't even involve a lot of physicality but it played with you mentally and that's when they locked them in the room in the dark okay. they I called it, it silence of the lambs Oh my God, I couldn't stop laughing. I was laughing so hard. I was crying because they were just messing with their minds. You know, they were just making sounds and and all that. And yeah, obviously, like at one part, yeah, someone gets hit with a bunch of, you know, rat traps and all that stuff like that. But just seeing them freak out in this dark room, as you have Pontius in the back, you know, being like with his penis tucked in dancing in the background while they have like the night vision goggles on and everything it's like it's so hilarious um i could see them do more stuff like that yeah because it's very smart very very smart but yeah great movie yeah and again a huge surprise there you know so uh well i started with one so what's another one on your list there I'm going to throw it over to Rathaniel, which is the new stand-up by Gerard Carmichael. If someone wants to talk about that not being a movie, it's directed by Bo Burnham, who's literally like an Oscar-nominated uh, and also has a stand-up uh, career. But his movie Eighth Grade uh, through A24 was like beloved. Mm-hmm. This isn't the first one that Bo Burnham has directed, but Gerard Carmichael is a low-key favorite of mine. I enjoy stand-up comedy a lot. Dude is really, really good at that craft. I had, um, I, I got to go see the taping of it at Blue Note, this intimate mm-hmm. jazz club in downtown Manhattan in the village. Um, if if someone's seen it, they already know what's so special about it. Um, I, it was on a level of stand-up I haven't seen before, and it's more, it definitely transcends the genre also. Um, he just hosted SNL this past weekend. Um, and is having a, a nice moment in his career yeah. where mm. the special drops on Friday and then he hosts SNL on Saturday. So I think it's news. It's not like I, I'd be outing him. About 15, 20 minutes-ish into the special, it starts obviously talking about family secrets and having a legacy of that. And it's, name, it's the name Rathaniel um, is his first name technically, but he kept that a secret. He talks about his grandparents having secrets and his... One of the lines he said was, "It's there's no easy way to say that your grandma was a side piece, and like about having to like keep her whole life a secret from a whole nother family in this small town." Um, and then talk about his dad having a secret of cheating on his mom, and even she talks about how he has a secret also, and that he's gay. And he comes out in this special um, where he hadn't come out before. And I'm in the room while they're doing the live taping. I think I was the second, because they do a couple tapings back to back. I was in the second right. one. And you're sitting there like, this is a favorite stand-up of mine. And he's been famous or semi-famous for a good five to ten years-ish in that range. Um, that was incredible to to be there in that moment. And he actually 
it's a it's a vulnerable stand up special. It's doing some really good like you it's stuff you would see back in uh, Richard Pryor days where the camera's like all the way up on him and you're seeing the sweat. And there's some really good um uh camera work that's being done and some really interesting decisions. It's very intimate. And then at some point um which I met the live taping for it and I was aware of some things that on the actual final product. So it looks like there's a natural conversation happening with the audience during the special. Mm-hmm. And to some degree, there's like, it, it almost looks like crowd work to where um, the whole last 15 minutes kind of devolves in a conversation with him and the audience. And someone will react to, to it or ask him a question like, and he says it early on too, I want, I want this to feel like a conversation. I want this to feel like family. I want you guys to just be yourselves. Um, this is kind of tense or awkward. But um, he invites everyone, and nobody spoke during the, spe- the stand-up for the most part, except every now and then somebody would say, wow, or, or something like that. There'd be some small. But the way they actually cut it together in the movie, I really enjoyed because it makes it seem like, at the end, he does a Q&A, basically, and people ask questions. They kind of cut those into the end. And so it feels even more intimate, like you just witness someone have a moment at the family reunion and then people are asking them about it or talking to them about it and saying like, well, how, you know, I think one of the questions was like, do you carry the shame of your father with you or something, something deep like that? Um, and he's like, has one of his gifts as a stand up is he has great presence of mind. He has, I actually listened to a 24 had a podcast where they did an interview between it was just Gerard Carmichael and Bo Burnham in conversation some years mm-hmm. ago, maybe three, four years ago. Um, and Bo Burnham was talking about all throughout, like one of his most interesting things about Gerard Carmichael is how he doesn't get frazzled. He's always like um, calm, cool, collected in moments where anybody else should be stressed out or freaking out. Um, and I, I think you saw that at, at, at SNL, if someone's only seen that monologue uh, yeah. or times where he's like in this highly stressful and he's just, calm cool he like takes his time he never loses his cool and this special he was doing the same thing people would ask really intense personal questions and he would give like a thoughtful answer in the moment and also have jokes uh so it was funny it was deep uh that has been a big favorite of mine so far this year and it feels like it transcends the the stand-up genre i'm gonna i like i i would include a stand-up special in movies anyway especially something like this where it's it's pretty pretty deep and it's not definitely not just a list of jokes from a comedian it was it was a whole event right yeah no, that uh, i haven't seen it yet but i've heard nothing but good things about it um and yeah i did watch him on snl and i thought he was really funny and i thought he did a really great job um but yeah he's 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 like hitting at a right moment right now because of like you said the release of that obviously before the special came out or the movie came out uh it was already hitting social media and all that so it, it's like you know it's interesting for something like that to happen um before he even makes an official announcement about it so it's like he you are experiencing it fresh when you watch it for the very first time so i i thought that was like brilliant the way he did that and it it works it works in um, the context of his comedy and the context of his storytelling. Because at the end of the day, great comedians are storytellers, right? And I think just the way he portrays and tells that story is so well done. And you saw that in the monologue of SNL, the way he can do that. Uh, the yep. way he addressed the whole slap, the Will Smith slap, and how they really <laughs> wanted him to talk about it and everything. I think it was just so well crafted, the story yep. and all that. You know, So I definitely, yeah, that's on my list. I definitely do want to check out. So, um. As far as like other things on my list, I mean, I'm going to get out some of the more obvious things that I think you and I, we both uh, share. And that's and again, we we done two uh, separate episodes talking about these movies in depth. And that is Everything Everywhere All at Once, which technically came out in Q1 if you lived in a major metropolitan city, um, you know, but it, it's really going to be coming out nationwide in april uh uh, so technically it's part of q2 um and the batman i mean the batman i i I don't think i would have 
ex- expected to have such a serious conversation with you about the Batman. But it, it turned out to be that way because of the way the movie was made and the way it was directed and acted and, you know, the cinematography and the editing and everything like that. It, it was a, a perfect um, comic book movie for a cinephile, for a cinema fan and everything because it, it really, really played to that. And yep. I, I, and again, I don't think a lot of us were really expecting that to be the case. Um, so just wanted to get that out of the way again. If you wanted to see more of our thoughts about it, you could see the videos that we did about it or the episodes that we have up on the channels there. But one that I will say that you will probably find amazing that I'm not even going to mention it, and that's Moonfall. Moonfall was a movie. Literally that next on my list. I'm not kidding. How are, are you serious? Things, bro? I'm dead what? ass. What? Pleasantly surprised. This is that's funny. Why, that's why we do this. That's <laughs> why we street. do this. Because <laughs> we're just there. Moonfall, I knew was going to be a shit show. But it's because it was that I loved it so much. I mean, it was one of those popcorn inducing, turn your brain off you know, yep. over-the-top action movie that is already well-known in the Emmerich world. I mean, if you love Independence Day, if you love 2012, Day After Tomorrow, this is that type of movie. Yep. You're not going there for the acting. The acting's terrible. You're not going there for the dialogue. The dialogue is terrible. But it's those action scenes that draw you in. It's that, you know intense moments of everything is going to hell and you just love watching it like a really bad train wreck and it's just it's i had so much fun watching that movie uh yeah it's not a great movie but it's still it's like i could see this like as if we were ever to do an episode of guilty pleasure type movies Mm -hmm. this would definitely be on that list for me of course i don't think there's anything wrong with that I know that I'm normally coming to this with the cinephile highbrow thing. I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I think it's 2022. Love is love. And if something brings you happiness, then embrace it. I don't give a shit if someone's going to say it's bad. Uh, like, wh- no. I had a fun ass time watching this movie. It was a good movie then. That's fine with me. It, it's mm-hmm. that simple. If, if we want to have like a conversation about like the art of the movie... It's not really good at anything other than special effects and having right. a cool ass concept where right. they just like took the one concept and they just like rolled with it for a whole fucking movie. That yep. was cool. They did a really good job at what they were trying to do. There's some days where I want to be challenged and I want to watch uh, some movie that's going to like really teach me about the meaning of life. And there's days where you might be hungover or tired or life's been stressful. I'm going to talk about one in a second, but um, you, maybe you were sick. And you want to watch a, a basic ass movie that is going to kill time, kill brain cells. I've had this debate with friends before of like, oh, am I wasting my time? I'm playing video games after work and I should be doing, I should, I could have, you know, cured cancer by now or what. <laughs> Bro, self care is the name of the game in this year, 2022. If you're yeah. going to therapy and like there's everyone talking about like, like to me, I go to the movies. There's times I go to have fun. There's times I go to challenge myself. There's times where it's literally therapeutic to sit there and be entertained and kill some brain cells because goodness knows we have too many brain cells in this life and too many things to stress about. And I'm not going to get stressed out about not stressing out about Moonfall. I'm going to have a good time and nobody gets to take that away from me. The other movie, I'm just going to go ahead and go to my next one, which is in a similar vein of popcorn fun times. It was Mm -hmm. uh, The Lost City. And we, we can bring it back to Moonfall if you want to. No, but I literally had that, the, I, I guess, I don't know if we're not mentioning it, but the thing that's been going around the last couple of years or so, yeah. I've had, yeah. I had that. Uh, and that's why I wasn't around for our, our live Oscars podcast. I wasn't feeling well. Um, I, my, my first day back out of isolation, I knew I wanted to go to the movie theater. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm not going to go see anything that's going to like, challenge me or upset me the movies i watched when i was sick growing up would be things like princess bride maybe ferris bueller's day off those were my two go-to uh because i want something that's happy and easy going when i've been like stressed out and like i'm not at my best so when i'm feeling puny i went and saw the lost city channing tatum sandra bullock modern rom-com modern romancing the stone it's (laughs) i told my friend i saw it they go you saw that was it good i go no 
it was I had a fine time though. I'm not mad I went. I'm grateful right. that they made this movie for me to eat popcorn to. Um I laughed out loud about three to five times during the movie. That's better than a lot of movies that I like are trying to make me laugh and are like supposed to be funny movies. I actually like you know, oh that's a, that was pretty funny. They they did a good job. They they followed the formula correctly. At no point was I like questioning the purpose of existence and thank goodness because i couldn't handle that question one more day after having been on the break and that was the exact medicine like for my soul that night i'm not going to go ahead and say i'm not going to say you need to watch it but that's one of the movies i saw for I was, like right at the under the wire of q1 um if you told me that they did that just so that the studio could get over some financial goal before q2 sure um but you did, no one needs to go see it there's worse ways to, to spend a couple hours at the movie theater. That's for sure. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, and again, what you said, I've heard a lot of people say the same thing about that movie. You know, it, it was just an enjoyable movie. Um, it's one of those great date night movies, you know, yeah. which we don't get a lot of anymore these days, you know, True. you know, especially because of streaming. Like it's so easy just to Netflix and chill like everyone else is doing. Right. But it's like one of those movies that is a great date night type of movie. You know, you're, you're having dinner, all that stuff. Hey, let's watch a movie. Boom. You know, it's like a perfect thing uh, in a closeout of the night and everything. Um, so I think it surprised everybody on how well that movie was. But you know, again, you should. It shouldn't be that surprising, especially with the the talent that's attached to it. And I feel like when you have Sandra Bullock in a movie, and it's looking more like a, a rom com adventure akin to like Romancing the Stone and all that, then you know she's going to do a great job at it. You know, because sure. that's she's that's her that. genre. She that's her genre, right? And then you add Channing Tatum in there. You know, you you know throw in a sprinkling of Brad Pitt. Then you're you're expected to have like a really fun time. So it 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 is a movie that I wanted to see. I just never came around to it. Um, but I and I'm still willing to see it because it just sounds like you know one of those times you're gonna have a night where you're just like I feel like crap. Let me enjoy something fun, and I feel like that would be the type of movie to go see. Lowest common denominator date night movie kind of concept, or like you don't know what to go see. Go see that one. It's fine. It's it was yeah. fun. If you like movies, like. It, it is definitely a movie. It is like one of those mm. timeless kind of like totally inoffensive. It was fun. I, yeah. I had a nice time. I mean, it's great. I mean, again, it's it's you don't get a lot of those anymore. So it is. And I feel like uh, this could be another conversation to have, if, you know, further down the line. But the art of the rom-com, like I feel like that's slowly disappearing, you know, or it's turning into something different that For sure. it's not. It's not the rom-com that we would imagine back in the day, you know. So I like the fact that this kind of brought that back for a lot of people. Um, instead of your movies like Marry Me or I don't know what the other thing that came out. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Comedies are, are in a weird flux in rom-coms for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, not, it's nice to get a little throwback, some comfort food for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, cool. Um, I'm going to bring up a documentary that I really, really enjoyed uh, uh, in Q1. And that was, and it's funny because uh, in another episode, we were ragging about um, a movie that includes the same uh, people and subject matter, and that's Lucy and Desi. Lucy and Desi is this great documentary. You could watch it on Amazon, um, but it was directed by Amy Poehler. And I think this was her first director. This was like her directorial debut. Um, but it basically just chronicles the the rise of Lucy Ball, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and kind of just how they formed, you know, and changed Hollywood with what they accomplished uh, during their acting career and their Hollywood careers and all that. It's so because, you know. I don't know if you you were like me. I grew up watching a lot of reruns of that stuff. And, you know, it would always be along the same blocks of the Honeymooners and, and all that. And, you know, Dick Van Dyke, Mary Tyler Moore show. And oh, yeah. it was definitely pretty funny. But you never really understood the significance of the production behind it all. You know, it and this documentary does a really great job at, you know, pinpointing a lot of the accomplishments. Like, for example... The Lucille, you know, Lucy, uh, I Love Lucy was the first syndicated 
TV program that recorded on tape with a live studio audience. Huh. You know, like no one's ever done that prior to that. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why was because they filmed in, in California. So people who would watch a live show in California will have great quality. But when it's broadcast to the East Coast, it's going to be of lesser quality. So to avoid that, they said, well, why don't we just record the show so that everyone can play it at the same time, at the same quality, and we'll record it in front of a studio audience so you still have uh-huh. that live feeling to it. Boom. Brilliant. Wow. Right? Yeah. And I was just like, wow, I had no idea that that was the case there. You know, and then you learn about a lot of different things that they invented that now is the norm here uh, for our sitcoms in general. Um, and, you know, just being able to see like the accomplishments and, of course, the relationship between them two and, you know, how they were, you know, madly in love and then it became more of this like um, b- um, business agreement and all that. But, you know, even though they eventually divorced and lived separate lives, they were still very much in tune with each other and how they still had that bond because of everything that they've been through. So I thought it was just a brilliantly done documentary. And I have, if you're into Hollywood and like, especially like main figures in Hollywood, then this is definitely a great documentary to, to check out. I'm going to add that to my list. Is it funny or is it more informative? Is there comedy in there? It's a, it's a mix of everything. Yeah, it's a mix of everything. Like, you know, again, they go through their personal lives, their on-screen lives. You know, there was a lot of, there was times where, you know, De, uh, Desi Arnaz was, um, they didn't want, they didn't think a show with Lucy and Desi would work because no one would believe that a white lady would be married to a Spanish guy. Right. You know, so what they did to test the audience was that Lu- Lu- Lucille Ball would join Desi on his road shows when he's performing live because he's he's a, you know, a, b- a bongo player and he's like the Cuban. He has a Cuban band and they would do skits live on stage and then they would gauge the reaction. And that's what they showed the studio executives that, look, people love this stuff. <laughs> And you should like, you know, check this out. So you get to see, you know, their challenges, their struggles, but also like, you know, it, they poke fun at a lot of things that they've been through in their lives, you know, how they come up with the comedy, the type of comedy that she does, um, you know, so it, it, it has everything in there. So it was just really entertaining and I wasn't expecting to like it so much. But again, if you saw being the Ricardos and you thought that was a shit show, then at least watch this because this will make up for it. <laughs> I'm, it's on my list now. Thank you. Sincerely. Yeah. Um, hey, guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. But before we continue, I wanted to quickly talk about Bulletproof Coffee. Bulletproof Coffee is my favorite coffee of choice to start off my mornings with. Why? Because it's clean coffee. What does that mean? Well, one, there are no chemicals in it. Why? Because they go through this multi-step process of making sure that all of their beans are fully clean and free of any chemicals so that when you get the beans delivered to you, it is the pure beans, the pure coffee, the goodness that you've been wanting, the taste, the flavor, and the nutritional value as well without worrying about any added chemicals or anything else put into the mix there. Um, it also doesn't have that weird acidic taste that some coffees get. Give you. I don't know how about you, but for me, some coffees kind of give me that weird sensation in my stomach, makes me a little burpy, and it kind of drags me down a little bit instead of really waking me up, uh, which is something that I need for my coffee every day. Bulletproof also offers a lot of keto-friendly snacks and supplements, anything that you need to kind of add to your everyday nutritional needs, add to your diet, and make you and pretty much transforms the way you feel uh, every day. So uh, for a limited time, if you use this code on that you see on the screen right now, low key geek, all caps one word, you can get 15% off your order. So what what is it better than that, right? Check out the link in the description of this episode. Use this code, get yourself your discount, and make your mornings a little bit more bulletproof with Bulletproof Coffee. Now, back to the episode. I'm going to check that out. Um, you sold me on it. I'm going to switch over uh, to another documentary about a famous couple of very great import, uh, Pam and Tommy on Hulu. <laughs> Bro. It's not a movie. <laughs> so technically, in the, in the miniseries world, I'll talk on it quickly then if you're not going to count it. 
just really good. I had a great time. Guilty pleasure. <laughs> I said those don't exist. This one definitely was just the most of that. They did a great job. Uh, I I enjoyed it. It was just very that, like uh, mm-hmm. not, kind of similar to the um, was it the American Scandal show where they're doing the. Um, O.J. Simpson trial, and they're just kind of like sensationalizing the ridiculousness of it all. Uh, th- that this show did a good job of that. Uh, right. um, I, I definitely binge, binge that one. The other, the other one I was going to mention uh, for real was there's actually two that I saw in those like um, the the pre screening things, and so I don't know. I didn't technically watch the final product. It was the they're trying to get the reaction and get people's opinions on them. So master was um, a new horror movie starring Regina Hall um, set on a college campus. And then the other one was When You Finish Saving the World, uh, the new Jesse Eisenberg directed movie that hasn't hit theaters yet, but it, it was at Sundance. Um, Master is the ratings are not doing well. I know that I had a terrible time watching that movie. I didn't think it was well done. Um, I did like seeing Regina Hall at the in the lead role of a horror movie and the acting, I think was one of the best things about it. Mm. Um, I, it's not my genre, so I'm, I'm not going to even talk about it too much. Yeah. Um, but that the movie itself, there's, there's just uh, too many decisions that I found befuddling and it wasn't scary enough and it wasn't thoughtful enough. And it felt like it was trying to do um, s- social commentary and it didn't feel like it was necessarily doing those things. There's probably mm-hmm. a, a, type of fan who would love this movie definitely wasn't for me um but then again i don't think it was meant for me and it's it's definitely not my genre uh the other one um with the jesse eisenberg directed movie when you finish saving the world loved it had a great time starts finn wolfhard from stranger things um julianne moore plays the mom there's uh i'm not gonna get too into it since it hasn't come out yet so spoiler free um i really enjoyed the writing of it um it in some ways it reminded me of like the art of self-defense uh the jesse eisenberg movie from a couple years ago there's this like tension and awkwardness that it's able to lean into and and follow that line well uh based on a short story from jesse eisenberg that i think was in the new yorker or um i know he did it in audio um a, a straight to audio book Thing, something like that um but it's a story by jesse eisenberg that he then turns into a movie it was a uh, really well done family drama mother son dynamic um i definitely recommend it if you're into those kind of like quirky family drama kind of things very uh literary well written um definitely an indie movie i don't think it's going to be a huge crowd pleaser um, I'm curious if the fans of Finn Wolfhard, like the obsessives, my friend's got a 12 year old daughter who's just obsessed with all the whole Stranger Things cast. And I was like, I think this is a good movie for them. There might be some theme subject matter stuff that's like either above their head or some tough things that you like, you'll want to talk to on the drive home. But I'm curious what the reception is for this one. But overall, if you're into those indie dramas, um, I, and there was, there was some humor in there, but otherwise for the most part, that kind of movie, um, I th- it was it was definitely worth a watch w- when that comes out. Nice, yeah. It it it's definitely on my list of things I was curious about because speaking of Sundance, uh, since we'll make that segue, I I did catch a couple of films at Sundance that I wanted to mention. Um, that was one of the movies I definitely wanted to see. I unfortunately wasn't able to get an online viewing of it because the tickets were all sold out for that those uh, slots that they had for it. But the the movies that I did see, because I at the same time, when you think of festival movies, you you kind of want to watch the movies that you don't know if will have a chance to ever have that mainstream release or if any streaming platform is going to pick it up. Obviously, they had some selections there that were tied to really big names and already were picked up prior to it showing at Sundance. So, for example, like after Yang was already picked up by Showtime to stream on that channel and, you know, that showed that debuted on Sundance. And then you had Fresh that was already prior, like picked up by Hulu uh, that also debuted at Sundance. So, I knew I was going to see those movies eventually, so I chose not to go for those. Um, one movie I did uh, give a, I gave a shot. Well, it's called Emily the Criminal. 
Emily the Criminal is a movie starring Aubrey Plaza. And the reason why I wanted to see this is because I'm a huge fan of Aubrey Plaza. But I only know her from being like in a lot of these comedic type of roles. This is the first time she's actually being in a role that's not only drama, but also some action involved in it as well. Uh-huh. And, you know, again, not talking too much about it without spoiling things. It was a movie that basically she is someone who's, um, you know, in depth because of her student loans and she has tons of bills to pay and all that. And she's just always finding herself at these dead end jobs, never liking what she does, ending up getting fired and having to have to find another job to to pick things up, right? So she gets tempted by meeting this kind of gangster-like guy played by Theo Rossi. Uh, You know him from like uh, shows like uh, Sons of Anarchy and stuff like that. Um, who's involved in kind of like some black market stuff. And she gets involved and now all of a sudden becomes this big crime aficionado and is like you know not not so much as like committing like theft or anything like that but she's doing a lot of fraudulent stuff and you know leading her own team eventually and all this stuff like so it's a weird turn for aubrey that i haven't seen but i thought she did an amazing job acting throughout it so um again i don't know if it's ever going to get picked up because i haven't heard anything about it but you never know these things could pop up on a streaming service or you know or whatever, but I really enjoyed the movie, and I thought the acting from both were actually very well done. They had very good chemistry there. Um, another one I wanted to mention was a movie called Resurrection. So it stars uh, Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth, and basically the movie here is about uh, Rebecca Hall's character is you know this very successful lady in, in in business, and you know she seems to be living a pretty decent life. And then she gets haunted from someone from her past, and that happened to be an ex-husband uh, of hers, played by Tim Roth. But she gets so um, scared, like you don't even know what the reasoning behind it is. But it turns into like kind of this psychological type thriller where you don't know why she's running from him all the time, until it's revealed, like really towards the end as to what the crux of the situation is but the reason why i like this so much is because of the acting involved in it i mean rebecca hall was so good in in this movie and she's a great actress in general and plus and i also love tim roth too and tim roth really really fit this role perfectly and if you do eventually end up watching it if it comes out somehow then this is a movie you'll know exactly what i'm talking about because the chemistry they had between each other you could understand why she would be wanting to run away from this guy because of the the stuff that he is capable of doing that you were not aware of until you you see you come to that point at the end of the movie so i will say though it has a weird twist at the end um that it's questionable uh but if you could like you know get past that and appreciate the movie for the the length of the movie itself and the acting in it uh, i think uh, you would really enjoy that movie um and lastly on my list of sundance mentions and notables here is a movie called speak no evil um it is more of a horror thriller type of movie this is a type of movie i would probably associate to like an a24 type um kind of like the witch or um maybe like a midsomar but not to that level and it doesn't really star like any prominent known actors uh it stars a a bunch of like you know actors that are known probably in um in uh in more like the the dutch countries and the danish countries and all that but basically the concept of the movie is you're on vacation you become friends with another couple and they invite you to visit them where they live but you don't really know them Right. But you guys got along so well for the three days you were on vacation. What could go wrong? And then you find out exactly what could possibly go wrong. And it's one of those like weird revealing things where, you know, like this could happen to anybody or any couple and all the shenanigans that happens afterwards. Again, if you're not a fan of thriller horror, then this is probably not a movie for you. But if you like these type of movies that are very suspenseful and you don't know exactly what's going to happen and then the big thing happens, you're like, oh, my God, this is nuts and crazy. Then this was a very well done movie for a very indie uh, production um, and it's it's nice to see that type of uh, artistry uh, when you have a chance to so so those are the ones I wanted to mention from Sundance that I saw nice. I'm glad you got to do that uh, good yeah. recommendations thank you 
Um, uh, the you're you're talking about Tim Roth. You're talking about indie movies. I'm thinking of. Uh, it reminded me of uh, Sundown. Uh, I got to see it at IFC Center. The director did a, a Q and A afterward. Is um, mm-hmm. stars Tim Roth and Charlotte Gainsbourg has a secondary role. It's mostly Tim Roth on the beach in Mexico after having dealt with some family tragedy. Um, and there's money that's going to be split up. And basically he just kind of like abandons his family. This is in the trailer. So I don't think it's spoiling mm-hmm. anything, but he acts like he left his passport behind while they're on vacation. And he just stays in Mexico. And next thing you know, he's like drinking beer on the beach, getting sunburned, <laughs> um, hanging out with locals, getting involved with some, some dudes who like, uh, shoot guns on the beach and like it's just mm-hmm. it's a really interesting midlife crisis movie uh, he comes from a very wealthy family so there's like this commentary on american greed or i guess tim roth's character isn't american um but on greed and tourism and something it's it was it was mo- way more similar to like an a24 this director did new order a year or two ago which was one of those i saw that it was playing a theater mm-hmm. i looked at the trailer and ended up having a great time um, a movie about social revolution in Mexico where they overthrow the wealth, the, the wealthy class. And it's the, the movie starts um, it's mainly at a wedding and you get to see some really wild things happen, including like the revolutionaries uh, do a lot of violence to the wealthy class at this wedding. It was like a cool, yeah. like what the fuck did I just watch movie? This one was similar, but it was much slower with basically no action. You're just watching a man in crisis, but watching Tim Roth, it was a short one too, which was nice. I want to say it was closer to an hour and a half. Um, mm-hmm. But I could watch Tim Roth for that amount of time, do anything in the world and seeing him drink beer on the beach and just kind of like lose himself was a really fun one. Um, <laughs> and then hearing the director talk about it afterward was, was a treat. Uh, I'm going to go and recommend that to any, any indie lovers. Those are the main ones I have on my list. I have a few we can get to, like, oh, I need to see this one. Um, and mm-hmm. I've got a couple that I didn't like. I don't know if you have any others that you liked on your list or that you want to recommend. Um, just a couple. So uh, I'll, I'll mention, you know, Turning Red, I thought was a great movie um, <laughs> from Pixar. It was very entertaining, very enjoyable. You know, a, a lot of people who t- couldn't get the concept of the movie and would complain that, oh, it's a movie teaching kids how to, you know, stand up to their parents and not obey orders and this and that. Like, you know, you totally missed the whole concept behind it all. Um, Yes, Red Panda, you could, it could be take, you know, mistaken for a metaphor allegory about periods and and a girl experiencing her period for the first time, which you could kind of understand for a certain bit of it, but it's really more about, you know, a coming of age, a girl, you know, living her life with her friends, you know, you get to a certain point when you're a teenager where you start questioning stuff for sure. Right. We've all been through it. And it's really more about like, how do you conduct yourself after that? How do you still remain your relationships with your parents when at the same time you're challenging them because you want to be the individual that you are and all that. And I thought it was just a really, really cute movie all put together there. Um, I really enjoyed it. And um, the Adam Project um, with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Um, I love this movie to a certain point. Um, But still, it didn't ruin my overall enjoyment of it because the kid they got to play the younger version of Ryan Reynolds is freaking amazing. Uh, This kid has a mouth on him and you could really, really believe that he is a younger version of Ryan. My only maybe gripe about it, or maybe it's not so much me, but halfway through the movie, I got tired of the shtick. You know, it's just like, all right, I get it. It's Reynolds, 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 all in your face, right? And that's just how he is, right? And that's just his comedy. And that's how, you know, you watch Deadpool, that's all it is, right? Like, he is Deadpool, you know? But overall, the acting was really done well in it, you know, for something that was straight to Netflix. This is the same director he worked on Free Guy with, and I loved Free Guy. 
Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you get the same type of action scenes. You get the same chemistry going on there. Um, Zoe Zaldana is in it, who plays a love interest. And I thought she was fabulous as well. There's some questionable de-aging stuff that happens in the movie that is really, you cannot ignore because it is just <laughs> really bad. Um, but it is what it is. But I thought it was entertaining and enjoyable for what it was. And, you know, it was a nice, pleasant surprise to find that on Netflix and all that. So, yeah, so those were the only other two I wanted to mention. Just to, just because to, to, I have to say it out loud, if you mentioned the Batman and everything everywhere all at once earlier, mm -hmm. and we have whole episodes about that. I'm not going to talk about yep. it more. Those are my two favorite movies of the year so far, for sure. I think oh, those yeah. are everything everywhere all at once, number one, and the Batman Same. is probably number two. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the year it's they're they're in similar positions. Those yeah. have been really special. Um, if anyone wants to hear us talk about those, we did long in depth podcast uh, episodes about them on the YouTube and the podcast. Uh, definitely mm -hmm. check those out. We don't need to talk about it more. I would be remiss if I didn't say those words out loud in the Q one recap. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, the the main ones I was disappointed by Death on the Nile and Tinder Swindler. I tend to just wonder there's like more of a meme than a movie. Like it was like a reference point where people like talk about it at the water yeah. cooler. Yeah. Um, but then the, I'm not even sure if we like, I, I don't know if anyone's taking it seriously. Like you probably already saw it or you didn't, or you heard somebody talk about it. Mm -hmm. If you basically, I went into it going like, Oh, I think I get what this is about. And then 30 minutes in, I was like, yeah, I understand. This is just, uh, the, the, these things happen. It's an internet right. scam story that wasn't that well done. Um, and then death on the Nile, I like those. I liked the other movie, uh, the other Kenneth Branagh, Agatha Christie movie, um, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. I did not enjoy this one. No. Uh, there was a lot of like, why did they make this? Why they? Yeah. Why am I here right now? And if I don't know if it was a cash grab, if this is like Kenneth Branagh just loves Agatha Christie movies and wants to keep making them and playing that Hercule Poirot character. The mustache yeah. was awesome. Everything else about it, uh, basically, like there's there's some bad acting, there's some weird writing, some weird editing choices. Just overall, a big old dud. And I think everyone's had that experience. I don't think it was just me. I would recommend it to someone if they love those murder mysteries, and if they're the kind of person who's going to read all the Agatha Christie's, they're probably going to be disappointed by this, honestly, like because it's it wasn't as good as the book. Uh, but otherwise, if you just like really love that genre so much you just want to see any old murder mystery and see them like uh i've got a friend they'll see every jane austen adaptation no matter what go for it, it enjoy yourself but otherwise if you're looking for entertainment or good quality cinema i'd say look elsewhere yeah no that that movie was painful it was really painful to watch um <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's it's rare that it happens, but this is definitely one of those movies where I just didn't like anybody in it. Like, there yeah. was no one that was redeemable, you know? Like, if I was Perot and, you know, doing what I'm doing there, I'll be like, why don't you just kill each other, all of you? Because I hate you all. <laughs> like, you're just all the worst people. You know, I, I love his character, and I love that they kind of gave him more of a background. You know, they were kind of like giving you a glimpse of an insight of like how he became how he is and da da da. I came back and he goes, and that's how you got the mustache. I go, I missed yeah. the only part. Oh, you missed that? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was like the, that was like the most intriguing part of that entire movie. You know, that's but <laughs> that, that's hilarious. That's uh, that's so funny that you missed that. But but yeah, it's like everything else and you know you had a pretty decent cast too but it was just like everyone was dialing it in everyone was just not there talking about bad cg i hated that part where they're in egypt and the dude is like hanging out right by the pyramid and it, like it looks so fake dude that you could totally tell that this was done in a freaking studio you know and it was just so bad and it sucks because this had a potential to kind of be like you know a franchise like knives out is turning yeah. out to be right uh but with the performance of this particular movie i i would be happy if they just stopped and didn't do anything else because it's yeah. not necessary no i'm with you in the in this in the same boat the, i it could have yeah. been a franchise and sadly now this may have been the franchise killer yeah. if they made another one i honestly might go see it the cast was so good and they can be entertaining 
I'd probably let a few other people go see it first and then say like, okay, this one was better than the last one. Cause this one felt much more like just a waste of time. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I just <laughs> looked it up the question of, did they film in Egypt? Here's how it goes. The film shoot was intended to take place in Egypt, but that proved too difficult. The team then <laughs> considered Morocco, which often stands in for other desert countries. But by the time the camera started to roll, it was decided to make England work instead. <laughs> oh, yeah. If and, you're going to do that, that, do it on location. Do the James Bond thing where it's like these beautiful plays transport me to another world. If your movies are right. on the Orient Express, if your movie is Death on the Nile, it did feel corny as hell. Definitely. Oh I was God. never hey, transported to another world. No, not at all. Not at all. And it's funny, like, as you read that whole recap, that pretty <laughs> much is the movie in a, in, a, in a way. It's just like, well, couldn't it do is. this, couldn't do that. Eh, we'll settle with this. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was terrible. But with that being said, uh, did you have anything else you wanted to mention about Q1? No, those were the disappointments. There's the ones of, um, the, basically... There's the ones you mentioned that are now literally on my list of to see. The main ones mm-hmm. I haven't seen yet that I need to are Kimi. Kimi. Um, yes. Yeah. I kind of yeah. want to see the genius Kanye documentary. I've got a, a tumultuous history of my love for Kanye and then now distaste. My understanding mm-hmm. is that it kind of transcends the current weird Kanye moment, and it's actually a decent documentary. So I want to watch that. Uh, Deep Water, and then is Morbius Q1, or, or is that? Are we talking about that Q2? Uh, Morbius, I guess, is kind of Q1 since it it okay. officially really opened on April first, so it kind of rides that line, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So that that's one we maybe we talk about later if we want to, but yeah. it's on my list only just for the hell of it, just to still be part of it, yeah, be up to date with the MCU. Otherwise, yeah. all the ones on my want to see list are ones you already mentioned in yours, and then there's some. Some movies that we're we're looking forward to, but any anything else on your end? No, um, nothing else. I mean, uh, going back on the whole Kanye thing. So I did see that. I did watch that. And um, what I will say is, because um, it's three parts. Uh, the first two parts I thought were brilliant. Uh, the third part is a little disappointing, um, only because, yeah, because there is a switch in the relationship there that what you were hoping to see you couldn't because of that switch right but that's that's all i'll say it's still worth the watch and if anything for those who are not very familiar with kanye and only see the kanye we see today then this is definitely worth watching Mm. because you kind of see what he really means to hip-hop and rap what he really means to uh the music industry and how because of his struggle maybe this is why he turned out the way he is right now you know and and all that stuff so it it at least gives you a better understanding of the person so that you could maybe later on form an opinion after that you know so i I do appreciate this that documentary for that purpose okay Uh, cool yeah so with that being said like you know what movies are we looking forward to for q2 um you know, Blake mentioned Morbius. As of the taping of this, obviously, I I saw Morbius already, uh, so I'm gonna leave that alone for now. Um, but maybe what will make it easier is let's go month by month. So in April, uh, yeah. I'm personally looking forward to Ambulance, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog two. Uh, what else here? The Northman for sure. And the unbearable weight of um, what's the full title of that one? The unbearable weight of massive talent. There you go. Yeah, like those are my really those are the movies I'm totally looking forward to uh, this month. Uh, what about you, Blake? Uh, I'm in the same boat. Uh, all the same ones. I I'm kind of curious about Fantastic Beasts. I mm-hmm. did enjoy the other Fantastic Beasts. I stopped enjoying Harry Potter. You already know it's not really my genre, but I might end up seeing that one if I just, like, want to kill a couple hours. Um, The other one that uh, I just saw the trailer for the other day is Duel, the new movie. Um, The the trailer played before Everything Everywhere All at Once, and I kind of go, oh, I'm I'm, going to see that for sure. Um, Aaron Paul stars in it and Karen Gillan. But the plot is a woman Ah. opts for a cloning procedure after she receives a terminal diagnosis. When she recovers her attempts to save her clone, 
when she recovers, her attempts to say to have her clone decommission fail, leading to a court mandated duel to the death. It just looks like one of those like absurd mind fuck kind of indie movies, weird stuff. Yeah. It's it's that's definitely my wheelhouse. Mm. I feel like I'll go see that if I'm in the in the in the mood to just deal with some bizarreness like that. That looks pretty interesting. Nice. Yeah. Um, I mean there's a there's also another movie that's coming out in April that I'm somewhat curious about, and that's Father Stew. Um, that's a Mark Wahlberg movie um, based off of a true story. Um, it, it, it sounds interesting, but obviously it's not the top of my list. Um, but it's one of those that if I get around to it, I'm definitely going to check it out. One of those things. Um, cool. So let's go into May. May is huge, uh, mainly because they got two movies that are right in my wheelhouse. And one that I mentioned last year was my most anticipated movie of this year. So we got first Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness that comes out in May. And the second one... Bob's Burgers. Bob's Burgers, Burgers the movie. movie. <laughs> yeah, that is my number... No, it's not. Uh, it's Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick has that potential to be that amazing sequel that Top Gun deserves to have because that is a movie that is so classic to me. Uh, And one of the reasons why is because I saw it when I probably shouldn't have seen it. I was taken to a movie theater with my mom and we went to a screening of Top Gun. It was a screening. I didn't know what the movie was. I was just kind of along for the ride. And I loved the living hell out of it. And then I remember afterwards they gave you like paper ballots to kind of fill out questionnaires and all this stuff like that. Um, But it was just fantastic. It's your quintessential 80s action movie. Um, Action drama movie, right? And of course, Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise, right? So I am just so looking forward to this. If the movie is a disappointment, I am going to be sad and I will probably cry. But those are my two uh, movies I'm looking forward to in May. And, you know, it reminds me last year, there was this classic 80s movie that they did the sequel to finally, and no one was disappointed. It was coming to America. And you were like, hell yeah, I'm glad I waited 40 years for this. And nobody was sad and everyone had a good time. Uh, and there was no disappointment in, bro, you think, I'm, I'm honestly curious because I think it's going to be good. Do you think it's going to be good? There's no way it's going to be good, right? Like the trailer makes it look good. The amount of hype and the amount of buildup and ever since like the push and it gets pushed a few times, it was supposed to come out like three years in a row now. I don't know what's going on. I'm, I, there's no fucking way it (laughs) could pop any movie. No movie has ever lived up to this, but I'm sure it's going to be good, right? It's going to be good, right? Right. (laughs) <laughs> here, here, here's what I'll say about it. If the movie was bad, they could have at least released it on streaming, but they did it. You know, they they said, you know what? We have every faith in this movie. Yeah. That this movie is gonna kick balls, Summer, and, and yeah, and it's just gonna. They the fact that they moved it m- multiple times, you know, okay, with the current situation of the world, that's understandable. But they kept it in the summer that this is coming out in May. They know this movie is going to blow heads and it's just going to be like, this is going to, okay. you know... You sold me, dude. I now my shit. expectations are through the roof and I will not be disappointed. Honestly, like, there hasn't been a summer blockbuster in a few years, at least the way there used to be. There's no, going to be, like, not. there was yeah. a, some movies that you go, oh, cool, maybe, but, like, In the Heights was around the time last year yeah. where it was mm-hmm. supposed to be and it wasn't and people weren't going to the movies like that. There have been yeah. a few successful movies... But I don't know that we've had a proper summer blockbuster. There's a chance. There's a chance they hit it on the mark and everything in the world is right again. No way that'll go wrong, right? No, of <laughs> course not. No, what are we talking about? Come on. Like, this, had, this has everything going for it to make it a big thing. You know, it's a sequel to a very popular 80s movie uh, that 
in a way you could kind of call it a franchise because they've had like kind of like books and video games off of this this title right it stars one of the best action movie stars around you know tom cruise you if you're a fan of mission impossible you know exactly what we're talking about there you know and it has i'm sure a killer a killer soundtrack you know which i'm sure we're going to be blasting off you know all throughout the summer uh you can't go wrong at all so tempted to start singing, but I I don't want to get this video <laughs> pulled after we've recorded so much, doing a whole tour, and then just humming a certain song could get us in trouble. No, so um, I, I'll move on. Take no, my breath, yeah, Renee. Yeah, 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 yes, I know. <laughs> Please I don't take help. my video away. Please. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's there's a couple sequels in May uh, mm-hmm. that if people like that world, I think will be Bob's Burgers. First time I saw everything everywhere. Oh, one. with they were like hyped, and as soon as they're like, oh my god, there's gonna be a Bob's Burgers movie. I was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> same with Down Abbey. If you're into Down Abbey, May is May is gonna be a good month for you. I don't care about either of those. Otherwise, it's exactly the ones you mentioned. It's sure. Doctor Strange, and uh, it's it's Top Gun. I, that'd be crazy if they pushed it again, right? Or if it was disappointing. There's no way, right? Um, no, so, not at all. No way. No way. No, no. It's impossible. It's impossible. Here's what's blowing my mind is I there's going to be another Jurassic Park movie in June. I, I just jumped in June. Yes, yes. Jurassic World Dominion. Now, I've like heard of this rumblings of the T-Rex feet from afar. And now I'm Do seeing you- like this is actually around the corner, dude. Yeah, oh I'm yeah, hyped. I know. Now this is going to be the sequel I'm hyped about. I Okay, the last most recent one, I didn't really enjoy. The other no. Chris Pratt loved. Oh, that was good. My that mind was, was the best one since number one. Yeah. This one, the reuniting old cast, new cast, they got Colin Trevorrow at the helm. I get my expectations real high for this one, and there's no way I'll be disappointed. Um, I'm seeing this one for sure opening night. I, as soon as it, it drops, I'm going to book that ticket. Um, I'm I have for that one for sure. Yeah, no, it, it is kind of crazy how they've been promoting this movie for a very long time. You know, basically, they release like these mini movies online uh, to kind of like, you know, give you a sense of the world that people are living in to hype you up and all that. But yeah, it's right, literally like right around Ooh. the corner. And it's got cold chills. The fact that they are reuniting the original cast is the thing that is like making me excited. You know, they yeah. got, you know, all three other prominent members there. Like, and this is going to be the first time they're on screen all, all together since the original movie. So wow. that's going to be fantastic to see. And then again, mixed in with the new cast of Dallas Howard and, and Chris Pratt and all that. So it'll be really, really fun and interesting to see. Um, uh, fingers crossed. That's all I could say. Fingers crossed on that one because that could be like a rejuvenation of the franchise, which after seeing the last one, it really, really needs. There's no way it's just a cash grab, right? No, of course they wouldn't not. do that to us. No, 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 no. no. Be- There's a proper story to tell, and it <laughs> needs to be told. Hence, <laughs> Dominion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've definitely hit for that one for sure. Yeah. Uh, what do you have? Anything on your June list stand out? I've got a, a couple here. Yeah, I, I got a couple, and and one that just kind of popped up today for me. Uh, so, um, Lightyear. I think Lightyear looks like that's going to be a lot of fun. It's a Pixar yep. movie that kind of, I guess, kind of shows the origins of the Buzz Lightyear character in real life and all that. So I think that that looks something that's um, going to be a lot of fun. Um, Elvis. I think Elvis, that's something yep. that after seeing the trailer for that, I am like really, really intrigued. So I, I'm really, really curious to see how that's going to come out. Um, Marcel in sh- the Shell with Shoes On. That is a movie after I seeing... On my list. What? Oh, yeah. Are that's coming real? out June 24th, according to this Ooh. list I'm looking at. Yeah. Ooh. So that could Hi. be a sleeper hit of the summer because... Okay. Yeah, if you haven't had a chance to see the trailer of it, it just released this week online. It looks charming. It looks heartwarming. 
and it's a nice mix of like that claymation style with live action it it i don't know it just has everything that i love and i think it's going to be something that will surprise a lot of people so i'm really really looking forward to that bro you just got me so excited I'm, now I'm, I'm so glad that my once i'm disappointed from top gun and then <laughs> a month later once i'm and disappointed jurassic, from park. jurassic park and then i'm gonna watch tom hanks in a movie about elvis and i'm so excited about that one and once i'm disappointed by that i'm gonna go see marcel and just have a crowd pleasing ass lovely lovely time those short films have been so important uh to me i can't even describe it of uh, the how many times i've watched that and the reason why it's so important but I, you heard me. I yelled in glee when you told me that. I'd forgotten yeah. about that, and it's not on this list I'm looking at. I'm hyped now. Hell yeah. yeah and man, Jenny but... Slate can do no wrong in my mind. What I'm trying to figure out, it was her. She was making those with her husband before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still her ex-husband. They're still making them together. That's, yep. I'm so glad they kept the team together. That was my first concern was, did they break up the unit? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but no, they're still working together on Marcel the Show with shoes on. Let's yeah. go. Hell yeah! Yeah, I'm I'm super stoked about it. I mean, I I briefly am aware of it. Like I I have not watched anything, um, but it's the trailer. I saw the trailer and it it got okay. me. And I was like, this it, I need to see this now. I really do. Um, so it, it again, it just and it, you know, anything A twenty four puts out, I'm always going to be curious about for because sure. I feel like for both of us that's our studio that's the studio that for speaks sure. to us probably the best right um so i'm, I'm always going to be intrigued by whatever they put out but really if you watch this trailer i will i will i would challenge you and and say that you were not intrigued or touched by, after watching this because it well, really looks okay. fascinating yeah it looks fascinating for me if you haven't seen the, the little short films they made back mm -hmm. in the day dude great use of 10 minutes of your evening okay just so lovely so sweet yeah. i'm curious how they're going to make that into a movie now i'm no as soon as we're done here i'm going to watch that trailer and get excited um nice. this is either going to be the best summer in, in movie history of sequels and ip of like things that i love dearly or it's just gonna be uh, the most disappointing ass summer uh in in a while we'll see can't, yeah, can't we'll wait see. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, uh, there's some other notable mentions here. Um, something I totally forgot. And this could just be me being nostalgic and all that. But in May on Disney Plus, they're releasing a Chippendale Rescue Rangers movie um, that looks kind of interesting it's like live action and cg mixed together um that was just a show i watched as a kid religiously so you know I, i'm why not right what could go wrong as you would say right um and then also in june um something that actually had a lot of buzz in at sundance was a movie called cha-cha real smooth which is uh releasing on apple tv plus um so i i've been hearing pretty interesting stuff about it um so that's something i definitely do want to check out on that platform yes yeah um yeah so that's pretty much like q2 i mean obviously the summer continues into july um and august but let's not get ahead of ourselves because you know there's who knows how all this stuff is going to turn out but we will definitely do another episode where we did like exactly what we did here we're going to recap what we thought about q2 and dive right into what we're expecting and uh, anticipating for q3 there um so anything else you wanted to add as something you're looking forward to um catching in the next couple of months um, we're, you and I are going to be doing this. We're going to have episodes. We talked about probably Doctor Strange. We've got a few of these movies yep. that we just talked about that we're going to be releasing uh, content on and talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for that, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I think like off camera, we were already like talking about some movies that we have to talk about, and yep. you know, those they're coming really soon too. So definitely stay tuned to the channel there to check out our thoughts and kind of like deep analysis of some of these movies. Uh, but with that being said, that puts us at the end of this episode. So before we say goodbye, Blake, where can people find you online? Go to Letterbox. If you don't have an account, make one. It's the best. If you watch this, you like movies, use the app. My account there is Blake Wolf S S N. Blake uh, Wolf W O L F S S N. Like Blake Wolf's screen name. 
follow me there, watch me log these movies as they come up. See the way I rated the ones from before, giving Jackass, I think it was four stars. It was a tough one for me. I was like, this is three and a yeah. half, this is four and a half. Landed on four. Um, th that, that's that's where I love to spend my time uh, logging movies when we're not talking about it here. Nice, yeah. And again, like we want to get more followers for Blake. He's currently at 17. Let's get to yep. 20 before the end of the year. That's just three. Let's just get him three more. Let's make his 2022 a great one for sure. Um, as for myself, obviously, Loki Geek, you can see where to follow me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, you can also have links, uh, access to links in the description of this episode. If you enjoyed this and you've enjoyed our company and talking about movies, then obviously you'd want to see more of us, right? So the best way to do it is to subscribe to this channel doesn't cost you a thing hit that notification bell and you'll be notified every time a new episode is uploaded onto the channel and make sure to hit that like to show us how much you really love us and if you're looking for an audio version of this episode you could find it on your podcast platform of choice under the low-key geek channel there and for audio listeners thank you as well for listening we enjoy your support and all that so that being said i'm renee that's Blake the Wolf, and we'll catch you all next time. Peace out, Peace. everyone.